The world egg has been an allegory for the birth of the universe since before recorded history. The symbol exists in every myth and religion that we can find. This indicates that either A, all of these civilizations somehow communicated with each other over vast distances of both location and time, or B, that they all discovered exactly the same thing by means of their own esoteric sciences. Both options are equally as startling. But the second option, B, indicates that the cosmic egg is not an allegory after all, but instead quite literally how reality is birthed from pre-existence. So our ancient people either had some kind of time-traveling internet or knew exactly what they were talking about. What if I told you that option B is not only more likely, but is in fact structurally backed up by modern science? To be clear, not mainstream science and its surplus of limitations and taboos, but modern science nonetheless. We'll jump into that after the intro. But first, what are the common themes of all cosmic egg mythologies? In Hindu mythology, the cosmic egg was split in half down the middle and wields a single point of death and rebirth at its center. The Upanishads state that this golden womb floated in emptiness before breaking into fragments that formed the heavens and the earth. The Rig Veda reads the same. In Chinese mythology, the universe was born from a primordial egg of chaos that hatched into a construct of order, a golden fetus. In Egyptian mythology, the sun, known as Ra, fell into place after being born from a primordial egg in a stage known as the first first occasion. In Hermopolitan theology, we have the Ogdode, a world egg that represents the conditions of existence before the gods created it. In Slavic mythology, blackness was enveloped in a golden egg, where we find Rod, fast asleep, floating in primordial chaos, waiting for the chance to grow strong enough to create his body, being our world. In order to do so, he had to break off into dual pairs, and until doing so, would remain unknown to himself. And of course, we have a long favorite of this channel's community, the Dogon tribe, who state that Ama was alone and the shape of an egg until dividing herself, establishing the four cardinal directions. Within this egg was the material and the structure of the potential universe. Ama failed the first attempt at this, but in the second attempt succeeded in planting a seed within herself, a seed that resulted in the shape of man. During the gestation, there was a flaw, causing the universe to be incomplete until the Nomos were able to utter the words of Amma, and this sound united the polarities of the egg. Although I have chosen my favorite segment of each of these mythologies, every segment mentioned here is found in one way or another in the other mythologies. Each segment is also found glaring us dead in the eye with new scientific terminology within the declassified documents compiled by the CIA. And keep the above mythologies in mind as we move forward, because the parallels are mind-boggling to say the least. All life springs from some kind of egg. Even mammals start out within eggs while in the womb until met with the seed necessary to be fertilized. With an ample amount of evidence that the universe itself was birthed in exactly the same fashion, well, as above, so below, it seems as if the cosmos is alive and aware of us, and is patiently awaiting the day that we grow enough to realize it. When the CIA quietly declassified its secret documents about reality and consciousness, it created a shitstorm of people who didn't give a hoot, but also a storm of people who connected the dots of world mythologies that tell an identical story in various terms. Mythologies that seem to line up with the self-evident gnosis of people who have explored meditation and hallucinogens. We are lucky to have bent 
Toth who seem to cover all of the above. Mainstream science has been running with the Big Bang Theory for as long as we can remember, despite how flawed it was and how continuously unlikely it seems to become. The premise for the Big Bang is based mostly on the fact that everything is expanding, but when we found out that the expansion is accelerating, it threw a wrench in the whole deal. So instead of turning to mythology and the esoteric sciences conducted by more clandestine researchers, they threw all kinds of new clutter on top of it, like dark energy, while simultaneously admitting that they had no idea what it was. But if we look at the shape of an apple, an egg, or uh, the magnetic field of a human body, and even the Earth's magnetic field, we see a commonality, being the torus shape. We will get to the evidence in a moment, but with everything in nature taking on this energetic 3D shape, to find that the universe was not this shape would actually be weirder than if it were so. And when we do consider the universe as having a toroidal shape, it answers more than just a few questions, including why the expansion of the universe is accelerating. In Bentov's model, we see the universe expanding as it exits this so-called white hole. As it drifts around the outer edge or the, the corner of this toroidal field, and spreads out like a fountain, we can clearly see that an acceleration of spread would take place in exactly the same way that water does if you, if you hold it straight up in the air. This tells us that the accelerated expansion is not only temporary, but will eventually coalesce back into itself at the bottom of the egg and enter into the singularity again being the other side of the white hole where we have a black hole. This is certainly the original idea of death and rebirth. The cosmic egg mythology of the Finnish diving duck seems to be where the so-called blood flood occurs or the first sacrifice so to speak that is simultaneously the sign of a fresh start or the union of all mankind. Mainstream science, however, seems to like better the idea of a forever expansion until the universe eventually spreads so thin that it goes cold and, and dies forever. As most of you already know, this is just not how a perpetually driven reality would work. Science of today certainly has a knack for spreading the idea of, of giving up hope. Let's break down this model. The idea of a white hole being not only the opposite, but in fact the other side of a black hole is, according to Bentoff, like that of a quasar. A quasar ejects a luminous jet of matter out of itself, like a laser beam, pretty much opposite of a black hole. Think of the skin of a balloon holding all of the dense air pressure within it. If the skin of the balloon is high in viscosity, poking it with a needle would not cause it to pop, but instead to release the air pressure as a single jet, a single point. The rubber skin of the balloon is like our physical reality, whereas the pressure within is not a component of our usual space-time, but instead a sort of pre-creation, or a stage for the potential unfolding of reality as we know it. This seems to be the very essence of our cosmic egg mythology. An omelet, if you will. An omelet. Anyone care for an Orphic omelet? with cheese and green peppers. The quasars and black holes that we see with our, uh, you know, telescopes and whatnot, are, they seem to be a fractal of this, these much larger macro black holes and quasars. The jet that emits from this macro quasar expands as it moves away and cools down, forming our atomic particles and radiation, giving birth to stars and then eventually planets and uh, an atmosphere as we have come to know. So going back to our metaphor of uh, holding the hose straight up in the air, all created matter, just like the water from a hose, will mushroom out and follow gravity back down to its source. But unlike our hose, which has a higher source of gravity beneath our feet being the Earth, the gravity will pull it back in 
and up into itself, causing this torus egg shape. And as you might be thinking, up is the wrong word for that because there is no up in this case, considering that the outside of the cosmic egg is just a uh, uh, proto space, uh, so to speak, or a pretty much non-existence like not even pre-existence, not even void. There would be no resistance imposing on the universe to be absorbed back up into itself. This is like if you were to burp and then suck that vapor back up into your butthole. Man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose subscribers with that one. A very large portion of the simulated universe theory hinges on the idea that mainstream science has measured the fabric of reality or the universe to be, uh, to be flat or two-dimensional, so to speak, like existing on a screen. Uh, this is not uh, conspiracy theory. This seems to be naive when you consider the fact that our torus shape has this the skin on the outside of it, like the event horizon of a black hole. If you were to imagine a cream-filled donut, for example, the dough on the outside of the cream is our physical manifest reality, whereas the cream on the inside is our pre-existence or the absolute as it is mentioned in, in these classified documents. And if you are wondering how donut makers go about filling a donut with cream, well, it is actually quite simple. You see, when a man loves a donut very much, as our portion of the universe completes its cycle around the skin of the torus, it begins its death process in a gravitational collapse. As it nears the macro black hole, everything becomes compressed to a degree that it, its density can be measured in tons per cubic inch. At that point, the gravity is so powerful that nothing escapes, not even light. And unbelievably so, after that, not even time. Then, as time itself gets sucked into this gravitation, everything coagulates into a singularity that is so powerful, structure itself breaks down completely until it is once again just raw information. Ones and zeros, if you will. Now that it is sheer information once again, it is ready to be recycled and emerges from the other side of the black hole into a, a reborn universe and perpetually. Keep in mind, this does not mean the entire universe is reborn. The entire egg itself is the universe. It is whatever section of the universe that passes through the singularity that becomes reborn. This is both very exciting and very scary at the same time, but we will not see it until after we have already physically died, at which point front row tickets to the greatest show on earth until we are ready to jump back in. This torus shape is uh, very much like that of a tree when you consider the roots at the bottom and the branches at the top within the center of this egg, reminding us a lot of the Nordic tree within their mythology of the cosmic egg. The rainbow bridge, I think it's uh, what it's referred to as. And this death and rebirth or destruction and order reminds us a lot of the Hindu mythology. We have the Brahma, which seems to be the white hole. We have Vishnu, which seems to be uh, the Taurus shape itself, the skin, or uh, as it's referred to as the maintaining of reality. And then of course Shiva up towards up in the butthole of this uh, Taurus shape being the construction, the, the blood flood, so to speak. God, I, that's uh, mythology is brutal. I, blood flood. I'm gonna make a metal song called Blood Flood. Maybe it'll be at the end of this video. As above, so below, it seems everything from us and all the way to the universe itself, indeed, is undergoing a continuous process of death and rebirth. Nothing in the universe is stagnant. The end and the beginning are exactly the same thing, like a yin and yang. And this yin and yang is helpfully so, exactly how the mythology of the cosmic egg is illustrated in Chinese mythology, as it was said that Pangu emerged from the egg, splitting it into two halves. One half was the earth, representing physical matter, of course, and the other half was the sky, of course, representing the unmanifest potential reality. 
As Pangu grew taller, the sky and the earth grew thicker and were separated further. And when Pangu died or cooled down, he became the stars and the earth. And I mean, go ahead and hold that right up against this new scientific method of the universe. It, uh, it, it really holds water. In a great interview with Neil deGrasse Tyson, he recently expressed lamentation over the fact that the universe is expanding so fast that our ancestors will not be able to see the cosmos from Earth like we do. His point being poetic points out that if they are going to miss out on that, what has there been before us that we indeed are missing out on now? But he seems to be ignoring the notion that it's going to come right back in this continuous cycle, making me wonder if he is either ignoring these new findings, well, uh, ancient findings, or is simply not allowed to delve into this particular research considering that it was classified once upon a time. I, I don't know. But if you ask me, real scientists shouldn't ignore data just because it was a secret years ago. Uh, and, and he needs a haircut. This, this cosmic egg is obviously a perfect allegory for the universe, but it seems as though it might also be a direct physical reflection of how the universe works quite literally, thus making it and all coherent bodies indeed alive and sentient. For evidence, all we have to do is compare these findings to the already well-studied formation of literal eggs. Bentov writes this in his essay entitled The Organizing Fields of Life. If we take an ordinary chicken egg and make two windows, one in the top and one in the bottom of the shell without injuring the membrane, then using a sensitive voltmeter with a set of silver electrodes, touch the exposed membrane at the top and bottom of the egg, we find a positive voltage at the top and a negative at the bottom. When we make two more windows in the sides of the egg facing each other and take measurements, we find no no similar potential difference. This indicates that there is an electrical field present along the long axis of the egg, which then has to turn back over itself as shown. This behavior has been shown to be true in seaweed, eggs, frog eggs, seeds, etc. This cross shape between the top and bottom of the egg and one going across reminds us a lot of the Dogon mythology who's got easily the best mythology of the cosmic egg, as they do many other notions of mythology. But this cross shape is represented in Dogon mythology as the collarbones of Ama being fused together, creating these, these four directions, so to speak, in a two-dimensional format. This was shown by Harold Saxton Burr, professor of anatomy at Yale University in 1972. These fields seem to be penetrating and surrounding living tissue. It has also been shown that the spine of a tadpole within a frog egg lines up along the axis of this potential field in the egg. I suggest that the shape of the electrical field governing the development and the form of living beings is mirrored in the shape of the universe. Here we have another example of a form on the micro scale appearing after many hierarchies of size on the macro scale. Er calls these the organizing fields, claiming that they come first, guiding the atoms and molecules of the growing organism into its proper form. What he is saying is that an electromagnetic hologram that changes with time makes up a mold, and matter eventually fills up that mold, giving rise to a tangible body. It is the first work actually confirming that our matter is held together by a four-dimensional interference pattern. If this is the case, then our planet must be a very large being, and the sun an even larger one. He goes on to say that the consciousness of the earth might be a temporary consciousness just like that of the human being and the same as the sun all of which seem to be granted a temporary consciousness by a primordial first cause hatched from this cosmic egg so to speak or a creator if you want to use that word 
In our previous video, we found that a state of infinite velocity is the same as a state of complete rest. In this way, the human consciousness is able to observe the absolute. This state of infinite velocity and complete rest is exactly what we see here in the nucleus of our cosmic egg, being the singularity of the black and white hole together. Which by now we can see that they are not literal holes, but are still in need of some kind of vocabulary to attempt to describe it. Futile, but necessary. Uh, but this is where the creator beings seem to be needing a futile description as well. At this point in the video, it is important to point out that just like the laws of physics and matter break down at this point, well, uh, so do words. But words is all we have to bring these things to elimination. Well, we got the diagrams too, but it, it, it's important to utilize the mind's eye to read between the lines where words seem to fail us and where words fail us is where our gnosis comes to shine. By all means, consult with your own truth when we dive this deep. Nothing else external can be more helpful, uh, no matter where it comes from. Uh, like the Buddha said, reject anything I say if it doesn't line up with your own core truth. About this creator stuff, uh, the declassified documents seem to indicate that an enormous consciousness is attempting to separate itself from the continuum so that it can start acting. It has become an entity despite still existing at the point of rest on our pendulum that we, that we described in last week's video. It describes the creator as needing to settle down and create blueprints for what it wants to do with his body, his body being the universe itself. It, it realizes that it has to create a consciousness equal to himself, potentially, in order to fundamentally understand what it is. And again, lining up perfectly with the mythology at the beginning of our video, it floats in the absolute until it has gathered enough information to do so, to become. To manifest. It needs the duality of itself to see itself. This is where it gets scary as we turn to mythology. In almost all of the oral traditions concerning the universal egg, it is said that before the egg hatches, thus splitting into two, it floats in a great void or some kind of waters of the deep until it has the nourishment needed to hatch. The parallels of the ancient times and the science we have in front of us here today are so eerily parallel that it it keeps me up at night. This is why I gotta blurt all this shit out on, on video. We are truly just now rediscovering the wisdom of the ancients, the, you know, lest we forget. And it doesn't just stop with mythological parallels. This concept fires a straight shot right into religion concerning morality. Bentov's documents state that this creator utilizes the duality of good and evil as a catalyst to speed up the interactions of evolution. The term good represents the knowledge of its universal laws. The term evil represents the ignorance of those same laws. In other words, being in harmony with these natural laws help produce an escalation in evolution, and anything that slows down that process is considered to be evil. But you need both. Just like the Zen masters have maintained all along, the creator walks the middle path. This primordial first cause manages to use both good and evil as friction in order to fuel the flame of constant perpetual evolution. The more evolved the creature, the greater its free will becomes, until eventually becoming a sort of co-creator. And I mean, go ahead and bust out any religious book that you got and tell me that this isn't the, the main theme. A frequent viewer of this channel is probably well aware of Carl Jung's great and highly misunderstood work entitled Answer to Job. Although impossible to summarize, it can be said that Carl wanted to indicate 
that the suffering of Job was meant to ignite and further along the consciousness of his creator. This notion was extremely controversial, especially at the time. But keeping that in mind, uh, let's check out what Bentoff has to say about what seems to be a very parallel notion here. At the beginning, the creator watches with aloof amusement as his creatures go through the events. However, somewhere down the path of evolution, consciousness will arise that will draw his attention. These will be creatures who not only contemplate themselves, but start contemplating him. When a creature has reached a level of development at which he understands his real makeup and perceives that thou art that, then he becomes self-realized. Henceforth, he will watch himself act within that scheme, but at the same time remain separate from his actions. This is analogous to the way that the creator operates, acting, but at the same time remaining separate and uninvolved in the action. The creator will set aside such a unit of consciousness and say to him, here, do this. It may just be little chores at first, but sooner or later, such a unit of consciousness will start guiding the evolution of the other consciousnesses. Once he has duplicated himself, he knows himself. So he closes down his shop, absorbing into himself all his manifest creation and returns into the void. We have to emphasize that the events described until now did not take place in objective space-time. In other words, they were only his thoughts and were not yet manifest. This sounds a lot like our, our Brahma in Hindu mythology, whereas we live within the dream of the Brahma. While the creator can take his time to contemplate, design, and construct his universe at leisure, to us it would appear in a big bang. Suddenly the whole thing would just be there. Again, with, with the concept of the Brahma, if everything is within a dream, it wouldn't be dissimilar to the way we dream. So whenever we dream, there's an entire reality, a place, characters, fictional or not, that just appear there all at once. They don't necessarily have to evolve into place because they are projections of our own psyche. And, uh, and, and Jung has just entered the conversation. Speaking of which, uh, wait till you guys uh, get a load of what Jung has said about uh, about flying saucers. He was like a prophet of the psyche, comparing uh, the weightlessness of saucers to the psyche. And I know there's a, a lot of videos online covering his take on it, but they never quite make the connection of what Jung said to what we have now by uh, Jack Valais, Jack Valais. I think I'm pronouncing his name wrong, uh, but what he says about ultra terrestrials and what Jung says about saucers is just, just peanut butter and jelly. I can't wait to, I can't wait to get to it. Back on track here. Uh, after reading that, we now have to wonder what causes the event of this so-called Big Bang in the first place. Uh, this question has haunted humans ever since we first had the notion of it but it might be helpful to go back to how we understand a normal bird's egg. Imagine that our said creator develops his own boundaries or real estate that will form his body or our world. This is like rippling the surface of water that was previously still causing it to become manifest. If we apply our toroidal shape to the rippling of the water surface, we have our eggshell. Let's remember the magnetic north and south of a chicken's egg. Energy is being built up at each pole of the torus, just like the chicken's egg. The accumulation of this potential energy will ignite and zap between the two poles, just like negative ions unite the sky and earth in a lightning flash. And with lightning, of course, comes a thunderbolt. Therefore, we have sound. Many of you, I'm sure, see where this is going. We now have the sacred ohm, A-U-M. In other words, the first act of fertilization has taken place within the egg. And now hopefully, uh, if you didn't get the omelet joke, 
of the beginning of the video that's become illustrated. Ah, oh, you guys got it the first time, I know. The thunderbolt, of course, is enough to disrupt our unmanifest reality that is the absolute, rippling the surface and creating physical matter. This discharge sets our proto-matter or pre-existence as illustrated earlier in the cream of the donut metaphor, and it erects a great column from pole to pole, and it mushrooms out at the tip and runs down along the shell, hugging the walls as it, uh, as it goes back down to the bottom where it is reabsorbed. We have now developed the so-called seed needed to fertilize the egg and the appearance of physical matter as we know it. Within this seed, just like the seed of a tree, is all the information is necessary to form the entirety of a habitat for many birds and other creatures, and in this case, us and our very consciousness. All of the information is already there and free to anyone. If the purpose of evolution is to produce consciousness of an increasingly high construct, then the universe is a teaching and learning machine simultaneously. Its purpose is to know itself, possibly through us. This is where Bentoff drops us a little hint, where he says, uh, study the micro and you'll find the macro reflected in it. In other words, if we study ourselves thoroughly, we will find the creator there waiting for us. I realize that theme is reoccurring on this channel, but it bears repeating. Probably the most important thing, period. The archetype of the cosmic egg is illustrated over and over again with a serpent coiled around it. This reminds me of the words of Christ who encouraged his disciples to quote, be wise as serpents. The serpent has enveloped the entire egg and now has two choices. It can crack the egg now and enjoy a minuscule meal. Uh, this is instant gratification or he can hold on for a moment and continue to warm the egg until it is ready to hatch on its own. And with a little patience and a lot of sacrifice, the reward of the latter is where we find the real fruit. You are the serpent, we are. And like I have said before, you should bear the serpent with the fruit that you have won.
drift through the doorway This priceless secret outshines The world's gold Simultaneous gods and words